Good morning. We're very glad that you can be here this morning. We welcome you to the start off, the kickoff of our annual Victory Lectures. We're very thankful for the opportunity to be together this week and study the Word of God together. Our theme is from the book of Psalms, Enlarging My Faith, Eliminating My Fears. The impetus for this has been our teacher at the school who teaches the Psalms and has for many years, Terry Jones. He and the lectureship committee have come up with an outline which in five years, every other year, will give us books, volumes on every psalm that there is. We'll cover 30 of them this year, 30 of them year after next, 30 of them the year after that, and so forth until all 150 are covered. That's the idea anyway, and if the Lord wills, we will proceed in that direction, having intermittent topics in the off years. We um, are uh, sad that a couple of people can't be with us for this lectureship, one of whom should be standing before you right now. Charles Abbey, a couple of weeks ago, had a concussion. Well, he called a couple of weeks ago and said that he had had a concussion and that his doctor had grounded him from driving and doing anything for a month or so, and so that would preclude him from being in this series of lectures. He sounded good when I talked to him. He said that uh, he thinks he's under the new concussion protocol that you hear about in the NFL a lot. He said, they won't let me do anything. He said, I've had concussions before. He said, when I was 12 years old, I had a concussion, and they let me off of school for two weeks and told me to go squirrel hunting. <laughs> so he said, I enjoyed that a lot more. <laughs> now he has to do physical therapy and not do anything else for a month. But maybe age has something to do with that as well. Charles is uh, a beloved person in our area. He taught and was dean at Ohio Valley University for many years, and he taught for us for about 17 years. And you remember we honored him last uh, June at our graduation as he decided to retire from us because the two-hour one-way drive was getting a bit too much for him. He was getting a little bit unstable on his feet when he was teaching, and he felt like it was time to back off and do some other things. He wants to do some writing, and I hope that he will indeed do that. Terry Varner is scheduled to speak tomorrow, and he will be having surgery for some severe back pain. That surgery is scheduled for uh, November 2nd, and so the doctor had grounded him from doing anything as well. Well, when I heard about Charles's opening, I thought, well, it's a Sunday morning, and it's going to be hard to get some area preacher to come in and do that because they'll be preaching for their local congregations. I thought about asking our keynote speaker, David Leip, to do that for us, but I thought that's kind of unfair to him with his very busy schedule. So you're stuck with me this morning in uh, Charles Abbey's place. On tomorrow, when Terry Varner's spot was, uh, I heard from Terry Varner on a uh, Friday morning that he wouldn't be able to come. Van Sprague was the first person I saw after I heard of that, so I asked Van if he would teach that lesson for us, and Van will be here tomorrow morning to do that. Of course, Van teaches for us and is our personal evangelism teacher at this time and one of our graduates, so you'll enjoy that as well. Right now, those are the only two changes in our schedule I believe that I have, and I hope that's all that I have. Those things happen, and we're uh, glad to be able to try and fill in for them. Charles gave us permission to use his material from the book. He submitted his manuscript some time ago, and it's a very good manuscript. So I've used some of his material, but I've tried to make it my own as well. So please, please uh, give him credit for anything that is good and give me the blame for anything that is bad in this outline. Our topic this morning is from Psalm 58, God gives me reward. God gives me reward. Charles Abbey is very careful in his manuscript to announce for us that this is a type of psalm. That this is a type of psalm that is grouped together in Psalms 54 through 59. They're all called Mictoms of David. Well, I'm not even sure what that means. Charles wasn't sure what it means. I looked it up, and it looks to me like, at least the few sources that I consulted, very few people are very sure what that means, and nobody's entirely sure. Some people have suggested that it means a golden psalm, that it's just a very special thing. It's one that's close to people's heart. Some people have suggested that it means a special treasure. Some people have suggested that it means a private memorial. Some people have suggested that it just has something to do with the musical character of the psalm because you know these psalms would have been psalms they would have been sung and they would have had in some cases some musical notation so maybe that's what's going on with the miktam i don't know much more about it than that the titles though we realize in the book of psalms are not really a part of the inspired text they came along very very early 
and therefore are to be regarded with some level of authority, but not the complete authority of inspiration that the text has given us. It was a miktam of David. This psalm fits into the category of an imprecatory psalm. The imprecatory psalms give first-time Bible readers and sometimes long-time students some real serious trouble as they read them. In the imprecatory psalms, you have a situation where the psalmist is calling down curses on his enemies, essentially. And it seems very counter to the religion of Jesus to be able to do so. Our Lord taught us, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. In Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44. But in these psalms, we have some troubling things. For example, Psalm 69, verse 25, says this about the enemies of the psalmist. Let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. Psalm 109, verse 8, is another psalm that seems to be imprecatory. It speaks of a ruler of that time and says, Let his days be few and let another take his office. Well, I've seen that on bumper stickers around every once in a while. And now we have the prophecies that sometimes might be regarded as a little bit prophetic when they're imprecatory. These two that I've mentioned, and Charles mentions in his manuscript, that these two particular imprecatory psalms might not be so much of a curse as they are a prophecy. Indeed, in Acts chapter 1, verses 16 through 22, you remember what's happening in Acts chapter 1. Judas has died. Peter announces to the apostles that Judas has died. They didn't need an announcement. They knew that, but he brings it up to bring up the possibility of getting a replacement for him. He says, this one has gone to his grave. This one has gone to his place. This one has had all his entrails gushed out. He bought a field of blood. Remember all of that language? And he says, as it is written in the Psalms, then he quotes these two passages. Let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. Indeed, there's one imprecatory psalm that gives people a lot of trouble. Psalm 137 was written about the Babylonians taking the Jews captive during the captivity from uh, 586 B.C. Those Jews at that time were very mournful over their captivity. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down. There we wept. We, and our captors demanded of us a song for Zion. And we didn't want to sing a song for Zion. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I forget Zion, my homeland, they were captive and they were sad about it. Well, the last two verses of that psalm call down seemingly a curse on, on Babylon when the psalmist says, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy is the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy is the one who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Well, you wouldn't think that any Bible character would ever want to see a baby thrown against a rock and have its brains dashed out. And indeed, no Bible character would. I believe what he's saying there, unless I'm mistaken in my understanding, is a prophecy. There are prophecies all throughout the book of Jeremiah and even in Ezekiel that Babylon that would destroy Judaism in that 6th century B.C., would then be destroyed by the next world superpower simply because that's how it works. God raises up one superpower to do his will, and then when they get wicked and evil, then he raises up another superpower to overtake them. So the prophecy is, happy is the one who repays you as you have served us. Well, what have you done to us? You've taken our little ones and dashed them against the rock. So the person that does that against you is going to be happy himself like you were happy against us. It's not necessarily a wish but it is a prophecy. But then there are some places that an imprecatory psalm seems to be something of a wish. For example, on the next page in your Bible, in Psalm 59, verse 5, another imprecatory psalm, You therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all nations. Do not be merciful to any wicked transgressors. Well, somebody will read that and say, that sounds like the opposite of what Jesus did on the cross. Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What do we make of that? Do not forgive any of the wicked transgressors. Well, maybe he means people that aren't penitent. Well, those people at the cross weren't exactly penitent yet. Jesus hoped that they would be. When he said that, it didn't mean that they were forgiven. It meant that he had the attitude of forgiveness toward them. Do not forgive any of the wicked transgressors. 
The imprecatory psalms impress me as the emotions of people who are oppressed by the wicked acknowledging the justice of God. God will put up with wicked people for a while. He'll let them have their way for a while. He'll allow them to believe the lie. He'll allow them to do whatever they want to do because of their free will. He'll allow them to punish. He'll allow them to oppress, but only for a while, as we'll see later in this psalm. And during that time, it's awfully hard to take. It's awfully hard for the righteous to bear up under the pressure. Remember the souls and the, under the altar and the fifth seal in the book of Revelation? How long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to them, and it was said to them that they should wait a little while longer until more blood would be shed, like theirs was shed, essentially. Well, the imprecatory psalms cut at the emotions of man. When you see injustice in the world and you get upset about it, as you should, you really have the power to do nothing about it in some regards, but you do have the power to bow your head and pray that the God, the judge of all the earth, who is righteous, who is holy, will do something about it. The Psalms express that emotion. Let me give you one more example before we get on to our assigned psalm this morning. Psalm 35, starting at verse 1. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. You see what the psalmist is asking? Lord, there are people who strive with me. There are people who fight with me. You, God, fight against them for me. Take up my case, on, take up my case against them because you're powerful and I'm not. They're oppressing me. God, please fight my fight. Take hold, verse 2, of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly and let his net that he has hidden catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. He sought after me. He wants me to be destroyed. God, please you destroy him. Sometimes that's all the prayer that a righteous man can offer. Of course, he wants people to repent. But if they don't, this is how he feels at the time. That's the import of the imprecatory psalms. You know, I, for one, am thankful that they're there because sometimes without them, I wouldn't know how to feel toward people who are oppressors, who are evil, who are murderers, who are unjust. I wouldn't know what to do about it, but I know that with the Psalms, at least I can bow my head and pray, God, let your justice be seen in the earth. It's a proper desire for justice. In an imperfect world, this is how we deal with evil. Well, the outline is partly Charles's and partly mine. Let's go ahead with it. First of all, in verses 1 through 5 of Psalm 58, we see a description of the wicked. First of all, in verses 1 and 2, there are silent ones. The New King James reads like this. Do you indeed speak righteousness, you silent ones? Do you judge uprightly, you sons of men? No, in your heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. Now that translation, silent ones, is up to question. Many translations go many different ways with this translation because I understand there's a problem with the Hebrew vowel points. I don't understand a lot about Hebrew. I understand very little about Hebrew. But let me give you what some of the other translations will say. They'll say things like, do you indeed speak uprightly, O congregation? Or, do you indeed speak uprightly, O gods? Do you indeed speak righteousness, O gods? Little g, G-O-D-S, plural. That translation, gods, is one that's very interesting because we know that there is no other thing such as another god. There is only one god. There's only one god who exists. There's the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the god of Israel, the father of Jesus Christ, the one who sent his son into the world to die for our sins. That's the only true and living god. So why would the Psalms have a translation that seems to acknowledge the presence of other gods? Well, it doesn't. 
That word gods is sometimes used for mighty rulers on this earth, those who are in power. It throws us off a little bit because of our English, I believe, but it's just the best translation that we have for some things that are in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word Elohim is at issue. Sometimes it refers to God. It's generally the one that refers to God in the plural, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, if I remember correctly. And this word here that's translated silent ones, this word that's translated congregation, this word that is translated gods sometimes, is awfully close to that. It's either Elam, E-L-E-M, or Elim, and I know I'm not pronouncing these close to correctly, or Elohim, depending on where you place the vowels. Now someone will say, wait a minute, we don't have a right to place the vowels anywhere because this is God's word and we can't change it. Well, that would be a good argument, except the original Hebrew didn't have vowels. And the vowel points didn't come along until about 600 years after Christ. So the written vowel construction really didn't come along until long after the inspired text was written. So there's a question. If you translate it E-L-E-M, you have silent ones. If you translate it E-L-I-M, you have gods. Well, what would it mean then? Do you indeed speak up? Do you indeed speak righteousness? You gods, you powerful ones of the earth, you ones who are in control, you ones who are in places of authority, that's what it would mean. Do you indeed judge uprightly the sons of men? That's one translation. There's a question in the next phrase as to whether the sons of men would be the object or the subject. Do you indeed judge the sons of men uprightly? Or you, the sons of men, do you really indeed judge uprightly? The word gods is also used in Psalm 82. And it gives us some kind of context for how we're going to view verse 1. Psalm 82 verse 1 says, God, the real God, the true God, stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. And then there's a question asked. How long will you judge, that is you gods, judge unjustly? How long will you show partiality to the wicked? That is, there were people in power who felt themselves pretty powerful, who felt themselves maybe almost divine, nothing new, and it'll never end, but some rulers think themselves just a little bit below God or indeed God themselves. They were really powerful, and they were judging unjustly, and they were showing partiality to the wicked. How long are you going to do that? Or, God, how long are you going to let them get away with that? God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly? How long will you show partiality to the wicked? And then later in that psalm, which seems to be a plea for God to intervene on behalf of the oppressed, we have words that are familiar to readers of the Gospel of John. I said, verse 6, this is God talking, I said, you are gods, you are children of the Most High, yet you shall fall like men, you shall die like one of the princes. That is, God in heaven acknowledged their place as powerful rulers, but reminded them that their power would only be for a time. They would fall like men. They would die like one of the princes. Now, Jesus played upon that psalm in John chapter 10 when he was answering people who were objecting to him and about ready to stone him to death. They had picked up rocks to stone him right after he said, I and the Father are one. Their charge is blasphemy. You're making yourself God. You, being a man, are making yourself God. Jesus asks them, for what of my good works do you stone me? They say, not for your good works. You, I mean, yeah, you've done these miracles. We don't stone you for that. But we stone you because you're being a man. Make yourself God. Well, Jesus uses some logic with them that I'm not sure I have my head completely wrapped around. It's just brilliant on every level, as you would expect from our Lord. He says, it is written in your law, I said... You are gods, quoting Psalm 82, verse 6. If he then called them gods to whom the word of God came, that is, God called them gods back then, that is, some sort of powerful ruler, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world that I am blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? That is, I'm the son of God. The father has sanctified me, sent me into the world. He called them gods back then. You shouldn't be surprised he's going to call somebody God now. And look, he has really sanctified and sent me. He didn't even really send them. I'm so much better than them that you can't even imagine it. That you didn't have any objection when he called them gods in Psalm 82. And now you object when I say I'm the son of God. Now, do you indeed speak righteousness, you gods, 
you powerful ones? Do you hold your silence in the face of wickedness? Isn't it true that sometimes those who are in power hold their peace when they ought to be speaking out in terms of justice? Isn't it true that those who are in power think themselves above the law sometimes? Isn't it true that those people who get in power think that they can do whatever they want, and if a few people die here for it to keep them in power, then that's all right. They're judging unjustly, and they're showing partiality to the wicked. We ought to learn from this that government should uphold justice. Now, I realize that Paul and Peter said in the days of a wicked Roman Empire that we ought to be obedient to the governing authorities. But in those passages, they also said that those governing authorities ought to have some sort of, of consciousness that they're supposed to administer the good and punish the evil, reward the good and punish the wicked. Remember Romans 13, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Do you want to be, uh, therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist bring judgment on themselves. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he, verse 4, is God's minister to you for good. Now watch the rest of verse 4. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he is God's minister. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That is, the government is given the power by God. They're not in and of themselves. The government is given the power by God, and they should Follow God's laws in administering justice. They should get the murderers off the streets. They should get the rich and powerful who are oppressors off of the market. They should get those people who are murdering babies out of the abortion clinics. They should get the people who are perverted out of the system. That's what they should do. But sometimes they don't. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the reward of evil and the punishment of those who, or the, I forget the rest of it, you left me right away, for the punishment of evil and the reward of those who do good. Government should be following God's prescriptions for morality in society. Do you indeed speak righteousness, you silent ones? Do you judge uprightly, you sons of men? No. In your heart you work wickedness, and you weigh out the violence of hands, your hands in the earth. That is, you're plotting how you can do more wickedness in the earth. You're not judging by God's standards. That was the case during the time of, that David wrote this psalm. It was the case during Hitler's regime. It was the case during the Roman Empire. It's the case now in many different parts of the world. The dictators get in power, and they make up their own rules instead of following what God wants them to do. I don't know why it works that way. Sometimes I think maybe a society gets what they deserve rather than what they need as a leader after years of ungodliness. I don't know, but sometimes it does work that way. Well, what we find out from this is that good people must not be silent. I'm impressed with Psalm 39, verses 1 through 3. I, uh, <laughs> I held my tongue. That's what the first part of the psalm says. I just decided I wasn't going to say anything. I was mute with silence. How does it read? I said, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. That is, I got so tired of speaking out about the wicked. I got so tired of taking punishment for speaking out about the wicked that I said, I'm just going to restrain my mouth with a muzzle so I don't say anything. You know what that's called for Andy Robinson? Getting off Facebook for a week. That's what that's called for Andy Robinson. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. And then he says, I, I, I was mute with silence. I withheld my peace, even from good. And then my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I opened my mouth and I spoke. Well, what he speaks here is a prayer for God to help him understand his days. But it reminds you of Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, doesn't it? Where Jeremiah said, I'm not going to speak anymore in his name. And Jeremiah was speaking to the rulers of the day. Jeremiah was speaking to the political and social situation of his day. I realize it was God's people. It was a theocracy. I realize that. 
it was a kingdom that was supposed to be a theocracy or something along those lines, but he was speaking to those issues of the day that including moral, that included moral perversion and killing babies, and he said, I'm not going to speak anymore. And then he said, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. That is, good people are not supposed to be silent in the face of evil no matter what realm it is in. Adam Clark comments on this, and he imagines a situation that when David was writing this, David had some people, or Saul, uh, had some people that were chasing David. And maybe, he says, I'm not going to read the quote to you, maybe, he says, Saul had a council of people that got together and uh, came up with a charge of treason against David. Well, that was judging unjustly. Well, let me skip ahead to modern application. I believe we have some responsibility. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them or expose them, depending on your translation. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. And I have to ask this question. Aren't we the government in our society? I will still hold. I will vehemently hold to the idea, even in the face of some of my brethren who don't want to believe this, that we are, as Abraham Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And when there are injustices and we keep our silence and stay in our church buildings and don't speak out against those injustices, we sin. Here are some quotes that are cliché. But cliché things are clichés for a reason because they're powerful and they're pertinent and they seem to transcend time and they're always true. Edmund Burke was a politician in Ireland and he said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. If people on the evil side of all these issues in our society could just get Christians to keep quiet, they will prevail. And by and large, for the last 50 years, they've done well. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor. I'm not saying he was a New Testament Christian. But he was coming to fruition in the 1930s in Germany. In the 1930s in Germany, I understand a lot of Protestants, a lot of so-called Christians, backed the Nazi party. Yeah, we think the Jews should be exterminated. Yeah, seems like a good idea. They, sent, they killed Christ. Seems like a good idea, they thought. Well, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and a few others, had. you see how people can just go along with the tide and not stand against it? Dietrich Bonhoeffer and a few others stood up against that. He wrote extensively from his incarceration in a concentration camp about the involvement of Christian in civil society and how he must make a difference. And for that, he was executed at the age of 42 a few days before the Allied troops came in and liberated that camp. He's famous for saying this, a silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Another Lutheran pastor who spent seven years in a concentration camp was Martin Neumoller, who famously said something like this. It comes to us in different forms because he spoke extemporaneously and said it in different forms at different times. One form is this. First they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I was a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up for me. Silent people. Silent people allow evil to triumph. Secondly, these folks in this psalm are sinful ones. Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. You ever hear an estranged wife and an estranged husband? They, don't, they are estranged from God from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Now, some people use this to say, see, there's original sin. Babies are born in sin. They take it along with David's cry in Psalm 51, verse 5, where he says, Behold, in, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. But these are not, first of all, possible. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Charles Abbey points this out in his manuscript, and it's a good point. Tomorrow, Van Sprague will have his family with him, Lord willing. He has two precious daughters and a brand new son. 
about two or three months old. I saw that son last week, and everybody in our little group was holding him. And you know what? That little boy didn't tell one lie. Never told a lie to anybody. Yet this passage, the word of God says, they go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Well, he's been born for two months now, and he's not spoken a lie yet. Because he can't speak. It's impossible. This is a figure of speech called hyperbole. They seem so wicked that it seems like they came out of the womb telling lies. Kind of like, you know, how you tell when a politician's lying, his lips are moving, that kind of hyperbole. Well, they also miss the point of the teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I've read a, a passage, read a passage in restoration history where one fellow said, one denominational preacher said, you see, you have to baptize infants because Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. Well, baptism's point, there's a lot of misconceptions in his statement there. First of all, baptism's point is the washing away of sins. Secondly, that baby has no sin. Thirdly, Jesus was saying, be like the little baby without sin, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, Jesus says to disciples who were fighting about how great each other was, he says, assuredly I say to you that unless you are converted and become as this little child, converted to become like the little child. Now, does he mean become converted to be a sinful person like the little child? No. Be converted and become like the little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, I say to you, whoever humbles himself as this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Original sin is not true. The book of Ezekiel, even in the Old Testament, is passed it on. The proverb was being passed around. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That is, dad ate something sour, and my, I get a bad taste in my mouth. They use that to say we inherit the sins of our fathers. But Ezekiel gives them three generations of examples. He says, first of all, let's suppose there's a father who's righteous. He doesn't worship idols. He doesn't lie with a woman in her impurity. He doesn't commit adultery. He doesn't covet his neighbor's wife. That man's going to live. But let's say he has a son who's a robber, a murderer, and a thief. That son is, not go is, is going to die. He is not going to inherit the righteousness of his father. And then let's say that wicked son has a son who sees the error of his father's ways and turns righteous. That son is going to live. He's not going to inherit the guilt of his father any more than that father would inherit the righteousness of his father. But then he sums it up in that verse in Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, and the father shall not bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Well, they were sinful. This is hyperbole to show that how sinful that they were. They weren't born in sin. They chose it of their own free will. But it sure seemed like they were born in sin because they were so wicked. How wicked were they? Well, they were senseless ones. Verse 4, they were venomous. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. Well, you've seen that kind of imagery before in that long passage in Romans chapter 3 that tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. They are, they, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. Their throat, uh, there is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their, with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lip. He's quoting Psalm 140, verse 3, which says, They have sharpened their tongue like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. You know what it is. I don't know if you know what it is to be bitten by a snake. I hope none of you ever have been. If you're bitten by an asp, you probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. You don't want to get anywhere close to those things. I was at my mother-in-law's a couple of weeks ago. We went out to my brother-in-law's little uh, couple acre ranch that he has. and He has a little lake with a paddle boat on it. And My son and his girlfriend were going to take a little ride on it. And they got to turn the paddle boat over and there's a big old copperhead. My uh, brother-in-law just nonchalantly gets a shovel and stabs at it, but he got it a little bit too far back. He didn't get it right at the head, so it had about eight inches to maneuver, so he had to make sure his shins got away, you know. And then what do you do? <laughs> you don't pick up the shovel, that's for sure. These people are so wicked, the poison of asps is under their lips. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. And they are like the deaf cobra that stops its ears. Now you think about that image. I just love the poetry in the Bible. You think about that image. It's got a double whammy to it. First of all, 
What do you think about when you think of a cobra? Well, you might think of some old movies where somebody's charming a cobra and making it do what it wants to do with the flute or whatever the thing that it's, that it's playing. But this cobra can't hear that because it's deaf. And not only is it deaf, it stops its ear. Well, it doesn't have any hand to stop its ear. You know it's poetry. It's figurative. It's like a deaf cobra that does, stops its ear. You know, like somebody says, la, 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 I'm not listening to you. That's the deaf, the deaf cobra is doing that here. Why? Verse 5 which will not heed the voice of charmers, charming ever so skillfully. The charmers are coming after it, but it won't listen. These wicked people are not people who will listen to logic. You can argue with them. They won't listen to logic. You can, uh, you can lay out a good course for them. Oh, I'm going to tell you this story anyway. I think I've told it here before, but I know we have some visitors, and it's just a prime illustration of this sort of thing. I got in one of those Facebook arguments with somebody about the subject of evolution. And I said, you know, I'm no expert in science or anything, but it seems more reasonable to me to believe that there was an intelligent being who created all of this than to believe we came about by chance mutations and chance things happening throughout billions of years. Well, he argued back, evolution is not chance. It's a well-guided mechanism. And I said, really? It's a well-guided? He said, yeah. It's a well-guided mechanism called natural selection. And nature just keeps rolling the dice till it gets it right. So he argued against my chance illustration. Evolution is not chance by using a rolling the dice illustration. What is rolling the dice except chance? People stop their ears. They won't listen to logic. They won't listen to reason. There was a time in my life where I was going through a hard time because some rumors were being spread about me. I suppose that will happen to about every preacher and a lot of elders and a lot of people, a lot of Christians at a lot of times. And uh, I got a little frustrated and wrote this little, this little doggerel poem. People believe what they want to believe. It's easy and quite the real treat. The truth can be hard to process and bear. Ah, let's get something to eat. See, what I'm trying to indicate with that is people's intellectual laziness. They want to believe what they want to believe. As long as their bellies are full, it doesn't matter. They don't think through the problem. The wicked certainly don't. Well, those are the sinful ones, the senseless ones. Now, and that was a description of the wicked. Now in Psalm 58, we have the psalmist's desire for the wicked. First of all, he says in verse 6, Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lion. Well, lions were often used in the Old Testament as a description of those who were in power, who were rulers. In Ezekiel chapter 19, you have a picture of a lioness who sets up her young cub in a position of power, but then he's taken captive to Egypt. And then there's another son of that lioness, that that young cub, that's taken captive to Babylon. Well, these represent a couple of the last kings of Judah in their context in the book of Ezekiel. And then there's Zephaniah 3, verse 3, that says, Your princes, or your rulers, are roaring lions in your midst. Your judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone until morning. Well, if they're going to be lions, if they're going to be the king of the jungle that's in power, wouldn't you rather them be without teeth? And so that's the desire for the wicked. God, break out their teeth. I know they're powerful as lions, but break out their teeth. Would you rather go in a cage with a lion with teeth or without teeth? There are going to be liars in this world. Would you rather them be in power or without power? Take them out of power is what he's saying. And then he says to wane the proud. He says, let them flow away as waters which run continually. You ever go to a stagnant lake and there's all kinds of algae and moss collected and you think, well, nobody's going to drink that water. That's a bad thing. But you go to a nice running brook and it's going it's smooth. Everybody likes that fresh running water. Well, that's an illustration for another time. Here's the illustration here. If you look at one particular place, I was taking a walk over in uh, another part of the state the other day and, uh, and came to a trout stream. And there were several trout fishermen and the waters were just flowing. And I noticed one thing about those trout fishermen. They're standing in one place. They're never in the same water. The water just keeps flowing by them. That water is only there for a second, and then it goes on. God, let these people who are so wicked, who are silent in the face of evil, who won't stand up for the oppressed, let them flow away as the water which runs continually. And when they bend their bow, let their arrows be as if cut in pieces. In other words, ruin their weapon. It would be like those old movies 
where somebody stuck something in somebody's shotgun, and so the barrel just kind of peeled back from the action. He's like, no, except more serious than that. The arrow is as I said, cut in pieces. It can't fly anywhere because you, when you let go of the string, everything just falls apart. Let that be their weaponry, oh God. And then he says, please waste the person. Let them be like a snail which melts away as it goes. Well, snail seems to melt away with that slime trail. Let them be like that. And let them be like the stillborn child of a woman that they may not see the sun. Ooh. Scriptures sometimes indicate in people's depression, Job, Jeremiah, Solomon, that sometimes stillborn children be better off than people who actually had to live through this life. This carries a lot of pain for people who had stillborn children. And you realize a stillborn child is a wanted child, an aborted child is an unwanted child. That's pretty much the difference. But so people who've had stillborn children, we see their pain. We sympathize with them. But consider what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 6 as he took the eternal out of view for a moment. He said, though a man begets a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but is not satisfied with goodness, or indeed has no burial, has no proper burial. I say to you that a stillborn child is better than he, for it comes in darkness and departs in vanity, or it comes in vanity and departs in darkness, and its name is covered in darkness, though it has not seen the sun or know anything, yet it has more rest than that man, though he lives a thousand years twice, but has not seen goodness. Do not all go to one place? In other words, if there were no eternity, and we're only talking about living on this earth, Oh, what a troublesome place it would be because you'd come and you'd fight the fights and you'd have some blessings, but you'd fight the illnesses, you'd fight the sickness, you'd fight the wickedness, and then you'd die. But the stillborn child has got to die, is what Solomon says. Jeremiah felt the same way. Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let not the, the, the man be blessed that brought news to my father, saying, a male child has been born to you, making him very glad. Let him be like the cities which God overthrew and did not relent, that he may hear the crying at the morning and the shout at noon, uh, th that he did not kill me from my mother's womb, that my mother might have been my grave, that her womb would always be enlarged with me. Why did I come forth from the womb to see labor and sorrow? That my days may be consumed with shame. That was Jeremiah's thought at one of his depressed moments. Well, flip that on its end. What about stillborn children? What if Hitler had been stillborn? What if Saddam Hussein had been stillborn? Or you say there had been somebody more wicked to rise in their place. Yeah, probably so. But the point of the psalm is, God, let them pass away like stillborn children that don't see the light of day. And then finally, in the last three minutes, the deliverance of the righteous. Before your pots can feel the burning thorns, verse 9. Well, there's an image. Thorns burn quickly. They're consumed quickly. Before the pots could actually feel the quickest fire that there is of the finest kindling wood that there is, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, as in his living and burning wrath. Well, God is described in terms of a whirlwind. He took up Elijah in a whirlwind, but sometimes a whirlwind can work some bad things. Now, this does not mean that tornadoes select people for punishment. No, that's not what he's saying. But it is an appropriate illustration, don't you think? Here, let them take, be taken away quickly, God. Let them be taken away selectively. You know how a tornado can fit, hit one house but not the next and leave it completely intact? It's not in our day, I don't believe, because those people are wicked and these people aren't. But he's saying, let these people be taken away quickly and selectively because of their evil. And then the righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. I had some quotes there. I didn't leave myself time to cover this, but let me, give me just one minute, please. Let, then the righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked doesn't mean he's enjoying washing his feet in the blood of the wicked, but it's picturing an army general going through a Jerusalem or a town that's been destroyed and wading through the blood, at least knowing that some sort of justice has been done. Do you want people to repent? Sure, I do too. I wish everybody in ISIS would repent. But outside of that, I wish the government would use the power of the sword to stop them from hurting people. That's the image here. Then men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous Surely he is God who judges the earth. He will take his vengeance at some time, and everybody will see his divinity, his power, 
and his justice. Thank you for your attention. Sorry I didn't get quite to it.